Okay, we're teaching on um, logic now, and um, at, at Fairhaven, teaching this uh, in, in an empty classroom. But uh, we, we've studied ethos, pathos, logos. Logos uh, is the third of the artistic modes of persuasion identified by Aristotle. Logos is the proof or apparent proof provided by the words of the speech itself. Let me repeat that definition to you. It is the proof or apparent proof provided by the words of the speech itself. Aristotle begins to discuss logic in the second chapter, book one, of his rhetoric. And he discusses it, uh, if you'll recall, he says that logic is the, I'm sorry, rhetoric is the counterpart of dialectic. We've said in previous lectures that uh, it doesn't, you cannot speak clearly and effectively if you don't think clearly and effectively, but thinking clearly and effectively doesn't do anyone any good unless it's expressed in spoken or written form. So rhetoric is the, the expression of clear thinking, and clear thinking is the result of logical thinking. The man who is to be in command of logos must, it is clear, be able to reason logically, so said Aristotle. So rhetoric and logic are both faculties for providing arguments. Logic would be where great arguments are created, and rhetoric where those great arguments are expressed. So when you think clearly and effectively, then you can speak clearly and effectively. Aristotle distinguished two lines of argument. The two lines of argument, and I, in this lecture, I am going to use the chalkboard, uh, because, especially because there are some diagrams that I want to draw up for you and explain what I'm saying. But the two lines of argument uh, he identified are special and general. Special and general. Special lines of argument are, uh, pertain to particular class of subjects. So, uh, for instance, there are lines of argument that are useful in math that are not useful in history and vice versa. Now, Aristotle actually discussed those special lines of argument in book one, uh, chapter three. He outlines the three divisions of rhetoric, which is political, forensic, and ceremonial. And then in chapter four through eight, he examines those three categories. In fact, it's beyond chapter eight. Um, Let's see, chapter four through eight deals with political oratory, and there he deals with the special lines of argument in political oratory, um, the forms of government, the things that um, governments concern themselves with, ways and means, national defense, that kind of thing. Um, happiness and its constituent parts. What, is a, what uh, constitutes a good thing? All those are special lines of argument for political oratory. Ceremonial oratory, he speaks of the noble and the praiseworthy. He um, discusses the, um, what praise is and how to heighten the effects of praise. Those are the special lines of argument for ceremonial oratory. And then forensic oratory, he discusses in chapter 10 through 15, ceremonial chapter nine, Forensic, chapter 10 through 15, he goes through the seven causes of actions. He um, identifies, um, let's see, wrongdoing. He gives a definition of wrongdoing. Um, he talks about um, when a person commits a crime, what his mindset is, the mindset of wrongdoer, and so on. All those are the special lines of argument that relate to forensic oratory. These special lines of argument are based up on such propositions as apply only to particular groups or classes of things. Uh, so, again, the special lines of argument are going to be used 
in a particular subject. The general lines of argument have no special subject matter. Aristotle covers general lines of argument in Book 2, chapters 19 through 26. Um, in chapter 23, uh, Ar Aristotle gives 28 lines of proof. 28 lines of proof that include opposites, modification of keywords, correlative ideas, a fortiori, time, to quoque, defining terms, ambiguity, lo logical division, induction, precedent, taking parts separately, consequences, dilemma, approval, rational correspondence, antecedent and consequent, change of mind, motives, inducements and deterrence, incredible things believed, contrast or contradiction, alibi, cause and effect, neglect of a better course, inconsistent actions, mistakes, and meaning of names. You can read that in chapter 23 of book two, uh, Aristotle's Rhetoric. Um, we also um, can provide you with a handout that outlines those lines of argument. Those are what might be considered the study of logic, the general lines of argument. And that's really what we're going to concern ourselves with in this lesson, um, in this set of lesson, lessons, is logic proper. Now, we give you the theory here. In our class discussion, we'll spend more time discussing how logic can be used and should be used in reasoning and in, in persuasion. But right now I want to give you the basics of logic. Logic is the science and art of reasoning. I like to say that it's the science and art of reasoning properly. But we use logic poorly or we use it well. We cannot choose not to use logic at all. So defining logic as the science and art of reasoning properly would cancel out improper logic or poor logic or ill logic um, or faulty logic. Uh, so understand, faulty logic is logic. Uh, and so as we discover the laws by which men reason, we consider logic as a science. And much of what we'll be discussing here will be the science side of logic, but we'll not limit our discussion to that. Uh, in our class discussion, our group discussion this week, um, we will be discussing um, logic as an art, and that will be the major focus. So here, the major focus is logic as a science. There, it will be more logic as an art, but that's not to say the two won't mix. There will be some logic as a science in our class discussion, there will also be some logic as an art in this lecture series here. So logic as a science discovers the laws by which mean men reason. Logic as an art discovers how to apply these rules in our everyday reasoning. Now reasoning, we can define, let me make some space here, A good definition of reasoning is drawing conclusions from premises. Drawing conclusions from premises. And there are two directions or two ways that we draw conclusions. One is from general to specific. Make sure I spelled that right. And the other is from specific to general. <laughs> we also have two types of arguments. We have inductive arguments 
and we have deductive arguments. Inductive and deductive. Induction reasons from specific examples to a probable conclusion. Okay, so it would be, induction would be specific to general. Um, induction deals with probabilities. have to think about how to spell that while I'm writing it. Okay, um, so, so for instance, in, a, in an inductive argument, the conclusion will be strong or weak. Let's see, my son has a, a fever and spots in the back of his throat he probably has strep throat. That's inductive reasoning, inductive argument. The conclusion will be strong or weak. In this case, it's a, it's a strong argument. Um, but there are other inductive arguments that we make. We do this pretty regularly um, that are weak. For instance, uh, my friend walked by me and didn't say hi and she was frowning. She must be mad at me. Um, that's the kind of weak inductive argument that girls occasionally will make. Um, and guys, on the other hand, will make a very weak inductive argument when they say, she walked by me and smiled, she must like me. Um, that's weak. Um, and girls, you're free to tell them that as well. Inductive argument, when we base the proof of a proposition on a number of similar cases, this is induction and dialectic example in rhetoric, all right? So in logic, um, inductive argument is going to rely on what we call example in rhetoric. Um, so uh, think of it this way. Um, it rained the last four days it's probably going to rain today again. Um, that's, that's basing a, a conclusion on examples, a sample set of um, things that have happened. Uh, we could say the same thing, um, let's see, um, whenever it's cloudy outside, um, it rains. It's cloudy outside right now, it's probably going to rain. Well, again, that, that's a fairly weak example. But if you say it's cloudy outside and the ground is wet, it must be raining. That's a strong inductive argument. Um, and it relies on examples. Uh, let me think of another example here that we could use besides weather. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I think that um, Aristotle pointed out one um, that was common in his day or commonly used in his day and it was that um, when such and such a ruler um, got a bodyguard he became a dictator um, and would name three different rulers that got a bodyguard and then became a dictator a tyrant and so now Julius has gotten himself a bodyguard, we can only assume that he wishes to become a dictator. Um, that would be a stronger um, inductive argument. So conclusions and inductive arguments are either strong or weak and can be strengthened by further information. I said earlier, I used the example of it's cloudy outside, it must be raining. Then I added in it's cloudy outside and the ground is wet. So then, it's safe to assume that it must be raining, pardon me. We can do the same thing. The guy who says, um, she walked by me and smiled, she must like me. Well, his case would be strengthened by other examples. She walked by me and smiled. She um, has said yes to me five different times that I've asked her for a date and her dad told me that she really likes me. 
I think she does like me. Um, so again, the, the, the conclusion is greatly strengthened. Um, you know, again, she walked by me and smiled, and we're engaged. She must like me. That's a much stronger inductive argument. Deductive arguments reason from axioms to conclusions which necessarily follow from them. They are general to specific, if you will, general in that they are premises followed by conclusions. Um, deductive arguments are measured by validity. They are valid or invalid. And in a valid argument, true premises must necessarily be followed by a true conclusion. You can't, if it's possible in a, in a deductive argument, if it is possible to have two true premises followed by a false conclusion, then the argument is invalid every time. When it's shown that certain propositions being true, a further and distinct proposition must also be true in consequence. This is called syllogism in dialectic, enthymeme in rhetoric, that according to Aristotle. So again, the conclusions are valid or invalid. In logic, then, there are three mental acts. I want to make some space here for myself. In logic, three mental acts that we must consider. Three mental acts and a corresponding verbal expression. The three mental acts are apprehension, judgment, and inference. Apprehension the mental act of bringing a thing to mind, apprehending it, all right? Then judgment, the mental act of establishing a relationship um, between terms, so judgment, evaluating what you've apprehended, um, understanding it, seeking to understand it. I got ahead of myself a little bit. Inference uh, refers to drawing conclusions from that, okay? So, let's go back to apprehension. Apprehension, the verbal expression of it, is the term. A term is a word or a group of words um, that um, expresses a concept. So, the apprehension would be involved, for instance, in apple. The term apple is an expression of our apprehension of that round green or red fruit, um, sometimes called delicious, used to make apple pies. Um, poodle is a term. Uh, let's see. Um, sometimes a term expresses itself in a group of words. Um, let's see. A... Um, Oh, a Ford Mustang is a term for a particular car. You can visualize that car. And the visualization that goes along with it is apprehension. And that's, uh, again, something we've discussed quite a few times. The way words conjure up images, those images are the apprehension there. So the mental act is apprehension, and the expression of that apprehension is the term. Um, what brings a thing to mind. So a word that brings a thing to mind. Um, I have chalk right here. This is chalk, all right? And your mind apprehends that. Then judgment is expressed in the statement. The statement relates one term to another. All men are mortals.
Okay, the term is men. Then the statement allows us to make a judgment. We can do something. With the term men, we can't really judge it. We can simply picture it, imagine it. I say men, you might think of the male species, you might think of mankind. Either way, um, the term encompasses both. Um, but you can't really make a judgment about it. You can only apprehend it, picture it. But then when I relate it to another term, and there are two terms here, men and mortal, they're related to each other, and then I can make a judgment here, all men are mortal, I can judge whether that is true or false. Um, in this case, of course, true. If I change this first word, all, and make it no men are mortal, then you would say that that's false. If I change the word no to some, some men are mortal, you would say that's false, probably, but you would be wrong. But that's because of the way the word some works in logic, and I'll explain that to you here in a few minutes. Um, but let's just leave the original statement on the board, all men are mortal. Inference involves um, an argument because we take these two terms, men and mortal, and we develop a, a, an argument that leads to a conclusion. Inference is drawing conclusions from premises. It is synonymous with reasoning. Um, so here I have all men are mortal. Pastor Malinak is a man. Therefore, Pastor Malinak is mortal. So this is really takes us from uh, the mental act, what's going on in our mind, to the way it's expressed and showing you how that works in logic. Here I take then two statements that serve as premises and I draw a conclusion from those two statements. Let's go back then and go through these again, all right? We begin with terms. If you will, the term is one of the basic, well, it's not, it underlies the basic building block of logic. Um, statements are built on terms. Without terms, without words, especially nouns and verbs, uh, we cannot make statements or inferences from anything. So a term is a verbal expression of our apprehension of a thing. An unambiguous noun or noun phrase. Um, there are a variety of ways of defining terms um, which we study in rhetoric. Let me clear this. We'll give you five ways of defining terms. The first is by example. Um, <clears throat> if I say chair, here is a chair. That's an example. And that's defining by, defini by, by example. Um, so, so essentially, rather than explaining it to you or giving a verbal definition, I give you an example, something that you can look at, something that you can touch, something in the material world. Here's a desk. I'm defining it by example. Here's a book right here. This is chalk. All that is a way of defining by example. Um, if I say define car by example, you might say Corvette. You might say Hyundai. 
you might say Kia, all right? All those are cars. Um, those are car makes. Of course, the guys know that technically you've got to give the model to. Uh, but anyway, um, that this is defining by example. The second way to define is by synonym. Finding a similar word usually needs to be more familiar than the other word um, or the word that you're defining. Okay, so um, if you were to define, for instance, sphere by synonym, you would say ball. Um, if you were to say, uh, let's see, define, um, let's see, uh, animosity by synonym. Uh, an easier word, if you know, a little kid says, Dad, what is animosity? You say hatred, strong dislike for. That's definition by synonym. Thirdly is by etymology. Etymology. Um, where you go through the, the roots of the word itself and explain those words, uh, those root words, what, they orig what the original meaning was, um, and break the word down so that you can give uh, the meaning of the word. Um, trying to think of a, an example here. The, the, one that I knew, the one that I'm familiar with um, is um, the word, the root word, here, I'll do it this way, um, the word seduce. Seduce comes from the root word duco, which in Latin means I lead. I lead. So that a man who is seduced is a man who is led astray, led into um, immorality. Um, so, you know, and, and the argument can be made and has been made, in fact, that a man thinks he's quite the man because he was seduced, but in fact, he was, in order to be seduced by definition, he was led into immorality by a woman. Now, that's an example of the power of etymology. It makes a word more vivid. Etymology can be um, a rhetorically effective way of defining terms because people are interested in history, more interested than what they let on. And especially, of course, if you have a good history teacher who can make it come alive. We like histories. We like to learn the meaning of, of a word. I'll give another example of definition by etymology. The word technology, um, technology, thank you. Hard to spell and talk at the same time. Technology is the combination of two Greek words, techne and logos, all right? Techne is art or skill. And logos, the logi there, we recognize like biology, um, ecology, sociology, theology, um, that kind of thing. It's the study of. So that gives us a different idea of technology and what technology is. Um, so that's the definition by etymology. Again, when it's used skillfully, it's rhetorically very powerful.